when the idea of the medical home was introduced into the VA, we already were at a pretty high level of function in primary care. And some of us were wondering what this would do to help us move forward. We've provided excellent primary care for the last 15 to 20 years. This is really trying to move us to exceptional care. We had to shake up the box a little bit and put the pieces back in together um, so that we could get a different outcome. PACT and the medical home seem to have taken primary care from a really strong foundation and baseline up to an even higher level of play. It's really critical for us to move from an organization that has been providing good health care to one that provides the best health care, the best health care anywhere. We have the opportunity to take an excellent system and make it truly the best. So it's really aspirational in nature, um, and that makes it hard, um, but worth it. Many organizations do not have the interdisciplinary care team available in one location to take care of the patient's complete and whole needs. So that is just the beauty of PACT. I've been in private practice for right at 20 years, and this is different. In private practice, it's still kind of a physician-based practice where uh, the physician kind of takes the lead role there and uh, everything else uh, uh, kind of is uh, integrated into the physician. Many years ago, for instance, in our specialty clinic in pulmonary, we met once a week on a Wednesday, and uh, the patient charts were, were piled up in one area, and all the pulmonary docs went in and grabbed the chart and saw the patients. And there wasn't really much continuity of care there either, because uh, the patients really didn't even didn't have their own doc, so to speak. The PACT model is different because you actually have a team of people that are responsible for you. I'm gonna just have you do a peak flow now. I know you've done this before. I think the patients are definitely happier because they're dealing with the same people over and over again, the same team. And it provides a continuity that really is what a lot of people prefer rather than seeing somebody different each time. On our green team, we have myself, the RN, we have an LPN, we have the doctor, we have a clerk, and that's the basic people that see the patients day to day in the clinic setting. We work as a team, not only the core team, but also the ancillary care providers, such as the nutritionist, the pharmacist, the social worker and the mental health person. They deliver care to that patient, the total comprehensive care. And um, the patient is in the center of the delivery model. I work at Arkansas Nuclear One, which is a nuclear power plant here in Russellville, Arkansas. I work as a safety technician. I love my job. It can be very demanding, but I love it. The things that I feel are important to me, first of all, is my family. We're right here on the water. Within minutes, we're out there and we're fishing or we're pulling the kids on the tube. Christy has some challenging issues. Her top three would probably be Sjogren's syndrome. She has biliary cirrhosis and she has fibromyalgia. Thank you. Thank you. Her blood work has to be done regularly. Here we go. We have to look at her immune system we have to look at how it's affecting her liver, and then how is it affecting her muscles and her pain. With my conditions, I do have times to where I'm not at my best as far as the pain level that I have. I mean, and sometimes it could go on for a few days where I just feel drained. For the problems that I have, I have to go to the specialty clinics, which are actually located in Little Rock. It's 84 miles away from here. And I'm afraid that if she had to make as many trips as she's had to make for lab and stuff, she might not have made them because of the distance. I think the PAC team has made a significant difference in Christy's life. I think it has taken a whole team approach to give her a holistic view of her medical home. Get you to put your left hand right in the center of that, okay? She still has all the access to big city specialist medicine if she needs that. She has a home base and I think feels more comfortable with that where we can coordinate all of her care. Now she has the ability to come here. She gets her labs done very quickly. She gets in, she gets out. Her primary care is right here. She gets in, she gets out. It's made her life a lot easier. Patient-driven care means to me the ability 
ability for patients to participate in their own care. It means spending that extra moment to figure out who Veteran Smith is. What drives you, what motivates you, and then bringing all our resources, our staff, our specialty care, all the resources we have to find out what motivates that veteran to reach his goals. It is driven by the patient. The patient sets their own goals. It may not be important to him what his hemoglobin A1C is, that, that specific lab, but what is important to him is that he's able to go out and fish on the lake. They get to decide what things are important to them, what things uh, they think that need to be addressed. Uh, of course, you do have to give your medical advice as to what you think are the most important things that need to be on that list. The doctor or the nurse may have given you guidance, but if you choose to not follow that guidance, they know that they're part of that team and that's part of their responsibility. Once they understand that they have a stake in this and that, uh, that it's driven by them, but we're there to support them and help them, then it, uh, then it makes a big difference as far as compliance and uh, overall satisfaction. I'm a computer technician. I set up computer networks, and repair systems. I have customers that uh, are as far north as, as Wisconsin and as far south as Florida, so I cover a big area. I don't know why, but I have this thing with my diet. It wasn't that I was eating the wrong stuff, it was that my eating habits were bad. I have diabetes. My A1C was, was horrible. In fact, it was so horrible, I can't remember if it was 11.7 or 12.7, uh, but it was, it was nasty. Hi, this is Dina from the Danville VA. Diabetes is a very complicated disease. You have to keep your A1C within a normal range, or at least well controlled. Uh, without the fluctuations, the high sugars, the low sugars. Get some weed back there behind me. All right, right here, go on, get that one. Mr. Cox was a little difficult at times, uh, just a little on the stubborn side. Didn't really want to adhere to his diet, to his medications. He was just not ready uh, to come in and, and talk to, to us. When I, we've talked to him in the past or called him, he says, I know what I need to do, I'm just not, not doing it. I went at it the wrong way. I weighed 247 pounds and I decided I was gonna lose weight. And the way I did that was I just quit eating. And what I did was I caused my blood sugar to go out of whack. And then when I did eat, I would eat one meal every two or three days. My blood sugar would go up. So it was, it was terrible. He doesn't take good care of himself. His hemoglobin A1C was skyrocketing. And there's some things that come out of that, that sprout out of that diabetes. Um, you know, I, I have neuropathy in my left leg and I have the shoulder problem with, the, with my right shoulder. He needs surgery on his shoulder and he was told that before any surgery can come he has to get that A1C down. Dr. DePedro kind of put it in my own mind that no matter what they did if I didn't take charge of it if I didn't take responsibility for it it wasn't going to get better. Dr. DePedro was very persistent and every time he came in once a year says hey would you like to come see our dietitian? He says we're going to help you with some medication but I want you to talk to the dietitian. Good morning. Hello. I have an appointment. Okay, your name? Cox. I was introduced to uh, Jackie on the green team. Jackie says, Tom, to get your blood pressure down, you gotta you know, cut the sugar down. You've gotta get exercise. You can't be a, 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 a couch potato. You gotta get out and move. Just taking his insulin, he's had a significant improvement. Now we're working with him with further exercise, diet changes, to can we bring his A1C down even further. Just recently he showed up on my doorstep and said, hey, I want to join the MOVE program. So I feel like i got people that are making it possible for me to do what I need to do. It looks good to me. How does the team approach work? Now that I've experienced it, I don't see how you can take care of someone and not have that approach. Your diabetes, as you know, has been complicating your health. That team was able to engage him at a time that he was ready to be engaged. That's personalized, that's patient-driven. Um, and, and he ended up making those changes. When I see a five-point drop in my A1C in 60 days and 1,500 points in my triglycerides, it makes a believer out of you. Frankly, it's an enormous achievement what he did. Um, it took an enormous amount of work over a prolonged period of time, and I think he's rightfully proud of that. 
So his quality of life improved through his engagement with the, the patient-aligned care team. That is what PACT is all about. Healthcare throughout our whole nation has always been very disease-based. You have diabetes, we're going to treat your diabetes. And what we're trying to do with patient-aligned care is move that from focusing on the disease to focus, focusing on health and well-being and the prevention of disease. And you need this prevention. First of all is if we see that somebody is overweight, right, and we know where um, what's going to happen in, in, in the future, or if somebody has the sugars that are a little bit elevated, we know what's going to happen. But if we start modifying uh, the diet and make them exercise, right, we're going to prevent diseases. And I think that's what we need to do. And that's what the PAC model is doing. It's designed to think beyond kind of a checkbox approach. Because all the boxes are checked, you believe the care is optimal. We want to move it so that we never have to worry about the diabetes. We, we want to worry about how do we prevent? How do we help you to be more active? How do we help you to eat better? How do we start establishing good habits early? So you get a win-win situation. The patient gets taken care of sooner. Uh, problems get eliminated before their major problems. And it's much more cost effective. So we've been working to really improve the coordination of personalized services that focus not only on the management of disease, but on the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual well-being of the veteran population. I was a, a plumber for 35 years and a certified welder. When I first started seeing him, he was working in construction and welding and was generally quite well. I was just treating him for hypertension and pre-diabetes. And I guess being in construction, putting up high-rise building, welding black pipe, galvanized pipe, stainless steel pipe, and the fumes from the welding rods, I think played a, a great, great big deal in my health. Hi, Mr. Ward. Hi, How are you sure. doing? Fine, thank you. We had found early on, because he'd been exposed to some welding chemicals and asbestos in Agent Orange, that he had some abnormalities in his CAT scan. And I had been following those along with Dr. Shalero, his pulmonologist. And it did reveal uh, uh, some subtle reticulations or striations at the lung bases that were suggestive of an interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease is progressive. Medical treatment is not effective in any way for the patient, so he was treated symptomatically. In his case, we talked about transplant because treatment with pharmacotherapy or medicines is not very good. We said, let's get all the tests we need, at least up front here, that are going to be required as part of a transplantation evaluation. In about 2011, he really began to develop respiratory distress. It was becoming difficult for him to even do normal activities. It's almost like having a, a sponge that instead of being wet and very compliant and moving in and out, is now stiffened. So where your lung expands like a balloon, mine doesn't. I was scared to death. Um, you could see he was getting worse and worse. It was getting more and more difficult for him to breathe. To walk from here to the elevator, I probably had to stop twice. You know, this, it was very short spurts and distance walking without having to stop. He was on oxygen full time, not just with ambulation or exercise. And the amount of oxygen needed was going higher and higher. It's a darn good thing they listed him when they did, because I don't think he had a lot of time on his hands. Ultimately, he was successful in obtaining a single lung transplant in January. The day after surgery, he called to say, you know, I'm, I can breathe well, I'm, I'm breathing again, um, and just want to thank the team for all their help. It's between night and day. In other words, I can breathe, I can walk, I don't need the oxygen anymore. You know, so I have a new lease on life. Mr. Ward stops by, like I would say, almost every day <laughs> I see him. He comes in if it's maybe just a medication refill that he needs to be done, or if he has questions about his medication. So I printed out a list of all your new medications. Or if he just want to stop by, just let Dr. Sherman or I know um, any changes that are taking place. 
Now he's back to his old self, demanding, you know, no patience with certain things. But, you know, he's back to normal almost. So it's been a journey, but it's one that we survived and with the grace of God, we'll go forward. If I have a thousand patients in my panel, prior to implementation of the PAC model, um, it's pretty much up to me to kind of sort of remember the thousand patients, know what they are having, who's doing what. It's very, very difficult. With the implementation of patient line care, the roles of each member of that team, that provider, the RN, the LPN, the medical support assistant, and the veteran, they had to change because you were going to empower each role to work to the top of their scope. My nurses coordinate just as much medical care for my patients as I do. They help arrange a lot of consults, uh, they help arrange social work, they help arrange transportation to get the patient there. I definitely think that it's a team effort. Each person has, you know, has a role that they play. Um, they all work together. It's a team approach every day. The, the burden just doesn't lie on your shoulders. You know, they have my records and they know me on a first name basis. And you know, once you see the same person over and over, you get more familiar and you feel more comfortable around them. So it's kind of like a family affair. I can tell them anything. Um, I'm not embarrassed to tell them any, ask them any questions or anything like that or have any concerns. They feel, make you feel very, very comfortable, just like I've known them for 20 years. I really like the idea of working as a team. It's great to discuss patients and to get ideas from a variety of perspectives. I just thought, wow, this is like being back in residency when you present a patient and everybody gets input as to, as to what needs to be done. And it becomes more of a learning experience for for everybody in that PAC team. Every morning, the PAC teams have what they call a huddle, and you get together with your doc, your clerk, your LPN and the RN, and we all sit down and we kind of plan out the day. When I first came here, I was amazed that my uh, nurse had already looked at my schedule for the next day and had taken notes, and that the next morning, we discussed each patient individually, what their needs are, if they're going to need lab, x-ray, EKG, and what, what some of their major diagnoses are that, that need to be addressed that day. We have our monthly huddle with the GREEM team members, the ancillaries like social worker nutrition, and those are times when we discuss different patients, troublesome patients that we need to work together to get something accomplished on. If I have a question, I use the other half of my brain, which is my LPN, and I will either instant message her or get up, walk out of my office, <laughs> and walk over and talk to her. They'll send me a little communication. We have the little uh, computer communication. They'll send me a little note, we need you for five minutes, or do you have time, or the veteran is here, we'll like to see you, what is your time frame like? And if I can, I said, be right there. My office is centrally located to all the providers' offices, and it's just a matter of a few steps down to the clinic area to see a patient. Specialty care is a lot more seamless in this system in, in that you have most all the major specialties uh, at your fingertips if you need them. We also have uh, facilitated electronic consults, so if somebody has a question or a problem that doesn't necessarily require a face-to-face -face encounter, with the veteran. That's something we could easily address electronically. You know, we have great care, some of the best care uh, anywhere, but we hear repeatedly that it's not very easy to access. We're leveraging other types of non-traditional appointments for veterans so that we can have better access. Not every patient needs a 30-minute appointment. Some may need an hour an appointment, but some may only need a phone call. It's really leveraging what is the right access for that veteran on that specific scenario. Over 25% of the visits are by telephone, and that's a real boon to our patients at work or have limited mobility. We really are trying to encourage that veteran to reach out and make contact with their RN or the medical support assistant and let them know, hey, I have a problem today. How's the best way I can handle it? For example, if they're sick at home, they don't have an appointment, 
they can call me and say, um, nurse, I need to come in today, I'm having these symptoms. Some of it is uh, proactive if patients don't show up for appointments or I, I know they're ill and I just need to check on them and find out how their diabetes is doing or their infection or their malignancy workup. I have the ability to call them between appointments. For the first time in my life, I had a doctor that called me to ask how my medications uh, were, were working out, if I was having any problems. Um, and frankly, uh, at that time, it scared me. I thought I was dying because she had was, was putting so much attention, uh, giving me so much attention, and, and I loved it. And then the veteran that uh, receives a telephone call on his lab and follow up doesn't have to come all the way to the clinic. He gets his care. Uh, it's quick, it's easy, it's accessible for him, and yet we're developing access for other veterans who really do need to be seen face to face. I think probably one of the biggest barriers related to patient line care team is just the, the cultural change and the acceptance of change. Uh, many of the staff had been within the system for a long time and that can cause, uh, we've always done it that way. Well just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean that's the right way. In the beginning, as with any change, there's always that little bit of unknown in the beginning as to what PACT is going to bring and what's, how it's going to impact within their work environment. As you know, change is not easy. And uh, we encountered many barriers, especially with the specialists. They, at the beginning, they say, no, we cannot do that. We have to really rock this boat. We have to change it up. We have to do, we have to do something different if we're going to get a different outcome. It's a little bit like a, a veteran who needs to change in terms of improving their health. Um, the veteran, at one point or another, will make the decision that they'll invest the effort to make that change. It may be tomorrow, it may be five years from now. I think teams are in the same dynamic. It takes energy, it takes empowerment, it takes collaboration, it takes a trust in your team members, and it, and it takes uh, a changing the way the veteran views us. I believe that once I started to hear more about PACT, what it is, they received the training, they got accustomed to the verbiage, then they got more comfortable in realizing that this is work that they already kind of do. Everyone here is willing to change and to learn, and that makes it a lot easier. Once they learn or they saw another group coming along and say, yeah, it's doable, uh, they got into it. This is a journey. We're, we're, we have a, a long ways to go. Um, there's no uh, finite endpoint, but I think we're getting better and better every day. Because PACT is evolving and we want to stay right with it and, and it's working great for us. We were um, concerned about um, investing two million dollars at the site for this PACT program and will we be able to make the return on this investment? If we do our work well, and this is a continued improvement activity too, we could keep more people out of the hospital uh, we can keep them away from expensive emergency rooms. We've seen the bed days of care decrease over the course of the past two years by two or three days on average for each veteran that's enrolled into the Russell Bell Seabock, and this is significant. We also look at ER utilization, so they're not visiting the ER as often. Now they know that they have an RN co care coordinator, they have a team that they can call directly if they need something. An admission to our hospital, for instance, costs twenty to thirty thousand dollars. One breast cancer admission may cost the VA three hundred thousand dollars. If you have identified one colon cancer by colonoscopy and prevented it, that saves sixty thousand dollars. So if we prevented ten such cases, that's already a half a million <laughs> and etc. And then one heart attack, one stroke, one amputation prevented. You know, one hip fracture prevented. It just adds up, even in the first year. And 10 years down the line, it's just gonna pay for itself over and over and over again. I've not met a veteran who, would, who says they would choose <laughs> to go to the hospital because it's a fun place to be. I think the hospital is 
uh, much better than it used to be in terms of pleasantness, but it's still not a very pleasant experience for, for most folks. We're getting the veteran healthier, keeping him at home, keeping him at work, keeping him with his family. Patients seem to be very happy here. The Russellville Seabock has some of the happiest patients probably. They're so thrilled with this model that it's, it's amazing. When you take a more holistic approach and a team approach to the patient, uh, the patient's happier and I think the physician and the healthcare team's happier because you see how it impacts their lives. Then that's what we want. We want uh, improved patient satisfaction, patient safety, the quality of life. So, and I think we have been able to accomplish that. Patient line care, uh, when we look at the data that comes out is, is successful and, and veterans are happy with the results, therefore the providers that are giving it are happy. Well, it's about relationships, right? Um, we talk about relationship-based care. It's about having relationships and you can see it in all three of our patients. I mean, the thing that, that really delights them about their care um, is the people that they connect with back at the VA um, because those people um, care about them. I could get my care at, at one of the other clinics in Russellville, but with the PAC team, with the VA here, I, I, I like them. They're, they're com comfortable with them, they know me. Um, it's just, we work really well together. It's made her a happier patient, and I think she'll tell you that it's made a big difference in her life. It's a choice for them. Uh, CBOC is a choice. Fortunately for us, we've been chosen a lot, and we're grateful for that. I love my PAC team, love them. Like I said, they're awesome. Um, I don't know what else to say about them, because they're great. I guess my overall impression about self-directed care is they're willing to tell you what you need to do. They're willing to ride your hind end if you don't do it. If you do do it, they're willing to help get the job done. Mr. Cox has really taken responsibility in his health care. I'm very proud of him, so he, he gets praises for his accomplishments. I really owe the VA big time. I couldn't ask for better care no matter where I went. If the goal of uh, the patient-centered care is to empower the patient to be in charge of their own health, uh, I can't think of a better example of it than Mr. Ward's case. I wouldn't be this healthy without the back team. Yeah, I feel like I'm an assistant coach. You know, and Dr. Sherman is the head coach. So she gave me the plays and I run them. You know. He's been doing fantastic. He's gaining strength and his shortness of breath is improving by the day. His whole outlook on life has changed because he feels so well now. I think every day for him is a great day. You know, it's, uh, you can see it in his face. <laughs> and I'm getting better and better every day. I'm loving every minute of it, every minute of it.